Thank you for joining us and a big heartfelt warm welcome from Keith Valentine and myself, Nikki Stewart, your Rock Jumper moderators for today's virtual tour. We know that many of you are not new to Zoom, but if you are, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and any questions that you have, feel free to send to us and we will answer as many as we can at the end of this webinar. To kick things off in September, our dream destination today heads off to Brazil's glorious Pantanal. Traditionally, September is a brilliant time of the year to explore this watery wildlife haven, and we felt it was fitting to showcase this spectacular part of the world as a virtual tour while Brazil's travel restrictions are still in place. Nowhere in South America are large mammals as prolific as the Pantanal, and it is well regarded as the place to see a jaguar. And the birding opportunities are remarkable with many stunning species being extremely approachable. Stefan Lorenz is our tour leader today, taking us to this mouth-watering, magnificent part of the world. It feels like a long time ago now, but some of you may remember Stefan as our guest speaker during our very first Dream Destinations webinar on Sri Lanka. This will be our 13th webinar in the series, um, with close to 4,000 live Zoom attendee views since we started, not to mention our YouTube, Facebook, and Zoom registrants catching up on the recordings. We want to thank all of you for your heartfelt support during these trying times. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to going to Brazil. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, for joining me, everybody. Uh, I'm excited to talk about one of the finest wildlife destinations on the planet today, the Brazilian Pantanal. It is an absolute dream for any bird watcher or wildlife enthusiast to visit. Uh, I can't think of any other place in South America that has a higher density of uh, large mammals and large birds than the Brazilian Pantanal. So I'm really excited to be uh, giving you guys an overview today. I hope you'll enjoy the journey. And uh, some of you may have been to the Pantanal before, so I hope you can reminisce a bit with me. Some of you have heard about it, I'm sure. Uh, so you can learn a little bit about more details. And if you've never heard about it, uh, be, be ready to be uh, amazed by this incredible wildlife destination. And again, wherever you may are right now, uh, please stay well and stay safe. And let's start our journey. So Brazil is an enormous country. It's the fifth largest country on the planet. And as such has an uh, immense biodiversity. It has the third highest bird list of any country on the planet with more than 1,800 species. And I'm not gonna talk about every single one of those today. And in addition to that, it is actually considered the most biodiverse country on the planet. Uh, if you add the plants and other animals to that list, uh, more than any other place on the planet has a high rate of endemism and so on. And I do wanna mention briefly that we do run tours to every corner of the uh, country. Um, we go to the northeast for the endemics there, various locations within the Amazon basin. We also go to the southeast Atlantic rainforest and other parts of the country in the central part of the state. But today I want to focus my talk on the Pantanal, which is considered the world's largest tropical wetland. And it is found on the western edge of Brazil, right on the border with Bolivia and Paraguay. It is mainly found in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, extends into the state of Mato Grosso, and also spills over the border into Bolivia and Paraguay. But the majority of the Pantanal is found in Brazil. To give you an idea of the size, it's about 75,000 square uh, miles or 145,000 square kilometers. It's larger than the state of Florida and um, 10 times the size as such as the, as the Everglades. So it's an enormous wilderness area. And by many, it is considered to be one of the most pristine wetlands on the planet. And you can see here in the upper corners, two signature species already of the Pantanal, 
the jaguar and the Pantanal must be the best place in the world to observe this large cat and the hyacinth macaw, uh, which is doing quite well in the, uh, in the Pantanal. It's relatively easy to see. So to give you a closer view of the Pantanal, and I'll explain a little bit about how it is formed. It is a, a lowland depression, essentially, almost right in the geographic center of South America. The geographic center is actually just to the north of the Pantanal, um, just a little bit east of the city of Cuyaba. And the Pantanal is a, a depression. It's um, only about 50 to 150 meters uh, in elevation above sea level. And it is surrounded by higher plateaus and mountain ranges. So what happens during the rainy season from November to March, water drains from the higher lying areas into the tributaries of the Paraguay River, uh, like the Sao Lorenzo and Takari rivers. And those rivers flood and they essentially flood the tropical savanna and grasslands of the Pantanal. And uh, that gives rise to an immense abundance of prey species, fish and so on, and immense abundance of water birds. In fact, more than 600 species of birds can be found in the Pantanal. So here's a satellite image uh, of the Pantanal, uh, sort of the green area right in the center here. You can see various circles and dots that mark lakes and wetlands. And the Pantanal is surrounded by three very distinct habitats. To the north and to the east, you can find Cerrado, which is a type of tropical savanna. And during our Pantanal tour, we actually do spend three days in the Cerrado uh, ecosystem in order to see the specialty birds there. To the south, you find the Chaco, which is a habitat that extends into Paraguay and into Argentina. And to the west, you find a unique Chiquitano dry forest, which has now been recognized as a unique ecosystem, uh, somewhat similar to what you would find in Northeast Brazil, like the Caatinga forest. And what's really neat about that is uh, out of those three ecosystems, uh, birds spill into the Pantanal, just adding to the diversity. And while this wetland is considered one of the most important on the planet, uh, shockingly, only 5% of it are officially protected within national parks and reserve, uh, reserves. The remainder is actually made up of private cattle ranches, enormous cattle ranches, which still do uh, quite well for wildlife, actually. During the rainy season, an incredible 180 million liters of water uh, pour into the Pantanal every single day and they flood about 80% of the Pantanal. During the dry season, which extends roughly from June to October, that water drains slowly along those tributaries of the Paraguay River. And the Paraguay River essentially drains this basin, forming one of the most enormous rivers in South America. The Paraguay River itself is 1,675 miles long. So to give you a closer overview of where we actually go on this tour, the tour starts in the city of Cuyaba, which lies about an hour and a half north of the northern uh, border of the Pantanal. It's a large city of about 600,000 people, uh, easily reached uh, via regular daily flights from many of the major cities in Brazil. So it's easily reached from places like Sao Paulo, for example, or Rio de Janeiro. From there, it's just a two hour drive south to the small town of Pocone, and there the Transpantanera starts. This is a 147 kilometer road, roughly 90 miles, that heads right into the heart of the Pantanal. It's a dirt road all the way. And Transpantanera, as the name suggests, it was originally planned to cross the entire Pantanal. That project was fortunately abandoned. It's the road floods in the rainy season. There are many bridges that need to be maintained. And now the road actually dead ends at a place called Porto Jofre on the Cuyaba River. And that's right in the wildest heart of the Pantanal. And that's where the highest populations of jaguars occur. But we take this tour in sort of three major sections. We spend time in the northern Pantanal, which has the highest diversity of habitats. So there's dry forest, wetlands, uh, forest edge, and so on. And that's where we actually see most of the bird species. We spend time roughly halfway down the Transpantanera along some of the uh, smaller tributaries where we take boat tours, explore for herons and kingfishers and so on. 
And then we spend time in the far south, uh, outside of Porto Jofre, in an area called the Meeting of the Waters. And that's where we really explore and spend time by boat to look for the large mammals. So this is the famous start of the Transpantanera, this famous wooden gate. And you can see the dirt, uh, it's already a dirt road from here on out. This dirt road can be nearly impassable during the wet season. Uh, we don't visit during the wet season for that reason, obviously, and can be quite dusty during the dry season. But it's just fantastic. Basically, you can think of all the transfers between different parts of the Pantanal as a safari, because you see wildlife along the road. If you look above the T there of the Transpantanera, you can see a mud nest of a Rufus Hornero, and you can see the bird itself sitting just above the N. This is one of the classic signature species of many parts of South America and also the Pantanal. And you can see um, the mud nest uh, up on the right there, uh, made out of mud and straw. And it's a classic oven bird, really builds this oven shaped nest. And the pairs will be duetting readily and they're quite noisy and form a signature sound uh, to the Pantanal. Here's another picture of the Transpantanera itself. This is about halfway down where there are some drier sections giving rise to dry woodland. And you can see this wooden bridge in the middle there. There are 122 wooden bridges to cross between Pocone and Porto Jofre. And they're in various states of disrepair. Um, some of them are being replaced by concrete bridges now, but they're still always exciting to cross these bridges, look down in the channels underneath. Uh, sometimes there's wildlife moving through. And this road is just incredible for wildlife. I mean, I've seen ocelots in the middle of the road in the middle of the day. I've seen anacondas go across the road. So as we're traveling the Transpantanera, we'll always keep our eyes open for wildlife. We can stop essentially anywhere and explore. There's a typical cattle drive. So uh, cattle ranches are the main economic uh, driver in the Pantanal. Fortunately, due to the flooding, the land is not really good for agriculture or other development. That's really what has protected the Pantanal, yeah, but it is used for cattle. And there are millions, I mean, in the Southern Pantanal, there are more than 5 million heads of cattle. Luckily, conservation groups are working with the ranchers, trying to come up with new systems of rotational grazing to improve the vegetation. They're also stocking some of the cattle herds with water buffalo and bulls, which will essentially protect the cattle from depredation by jaguars, which is one of the main problems leading to persecution of jaguars. But luckily, due to the increased tourism, the jaguars have really been protected in the Pantanal because ranchers see them as income, and many of the ranches now have eco lodges and the wildlife attracts tourists and income in protecting uh, all the wildlife of the Pantanal. And you can see a typical Pantanero or a cowboy, Pantanal cowboy in the front of the herd there. We do most of our birding uh, along side roads, um, not necessarily along the main road. This is a side road on one of the large ranches and it's just incredibly diverse uh, wetland full of life. You can see a caiman, laying on the side of the road there, a limpkin feeding to the left of the bridge, a plumbeous ibis standing in the middle of the track. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. And this is a two minute walk away from the lodge. You actually don't have to go very far in the Pantanal to be surrounded by wildlife. And to me, the first morning in the Pantanal has to be one of the most special, spectacular experiences on any tour anywhere in the world. So imagine you arrive in Cuyaba in the late afternoon, you drive, to the first lodge at the northern end of the Pantanal, uh, check in, go to bed, get a good night's sleep, get some rest, and then you wake up the next morning with a cup of coffee in hand and you step outside and you probably wouldn't make it more than a few hundred yards within the first three or four hours. It's just packed with wildlife and um, much of it is easy to photograph, so it really slows you down. For example, you might step outside and the first animal you'll see is a crab eating fox. Very unusual fox that does feed on crabs a lot during the wet season. It's omnivorous during the rest of the year. And sometimes there's a pair hanging around the lodges looking for scraps. But uh, this might be the very first mammal you actually see during your Pantanal adventure. And then as you scan around through the yard, you'll see the Chaco Chachalaca. This bird has been calling since before sunrise, most likely chachalaca means to chatter. 
very common around human habitation, beautiful Chaco Chachalaca. And then scanning the grasslands, you'll see great areas. Um, this is the largest bird in, the, uh, in South America. It's, uh, uh, the family Reidae is endemic to South America, part of the rat types. And they have a really interesting breeding system. The male will set up a territory and defend the nest and multiple females will lay eggs into that nest. It can, can have up to 30 eggs and then the male will incubate those eggs and take care of the young where the females seek out another male to lay further eggs, allowing the female actually to lay up to 40 eggs per breeding season, kind of compensating for high predation rates. Not as tall, but equally impressive as the red-legged Sariyama. This belongs to a family, uh, Kar Karima, oh, sorry. It's basically a endemic family to South America. Uh, there are only two species, and this red-legged Sariyama is easy to see in uh, the Pantanal as you're strolling across these grasslands looking for large insects and lizards and so on. Superficially, it looks a little bit like an African secretary bird, uh, but it's actually unrelated. Uh, the Sariyamas are more closely related to cranes, and they're quite raucous and loud. In the early mornings, they'll duet and they call oftentimes from the top of termite mounds. And then we uh, focus our attention on the vast wetlands, chock full with egrets, waders, and ibis, and also mammals. Uh, the capybara is always around in the Pantanal. This is the world's largest rodent. They can live in large groups, up to 100 strong, and it's basically the size of a small sheep. It can weigh up to 145 pounds. It's a semi-aquatic rodent, readily goes into the water, can dive for up to five minutes, and then comes out onto land to browse on vegetation. This is uh, one of the preferred foods of the jaguar, but these capybaras are really careful and always keep an eye out. And they have this alarm call, this snort that they give, and then they all launch themselves like rockets into the water and dive to safety. There are also many storks around, like this wood stork. Uh, they have a really cool feeding behavior. They'll dip their bill halfway into the water, open it uh, slightly, waiting for minnows to swim in. And if they detect the minnow, they can snap that bill shut in 25 milliseconds. It's one of the fastest reaction times of any known vertebrate. And of course, the massive jaguar stork is also present in excellent numbers. Thousands of pairs nest in the Pantanal. Really impressive stork. It can inflate this neck pouch during territorial displays or during other displays. And incredibly, for such a large species, it lays two to three eggs, but it can actually lay up to five eggs and raise up to five young. Uh, of course, that's aided by the abundance of food found in the Pantanal. And to give you an idea of its size, here's another photo of one standing on a beach. It is the tallest flying bird in South America, standing five feet tall with an eight foot wingspan and always impressive to see. There are also screamers. Uh, southern screamers are quite common. Another really unique lineage of birds. Anhimidae is the family, and this is also a family that's endemic to South America. There are only three species. For a while, they were thought to be gallinaceous birds. It's now known that they're most closely related to waterfowl, particularly the Australasian magpie goose. It's uh, one, it's the only lineage of birds that lacks uncinate processes. Uh, these are extensions from the ribs that actually strengthen the rib cage of other bird lineages. So this is a really ancient offshoot. And the males actually also have spurs on their wing that they use for territorial fights that can break off and regrow. So a really bizarre group of birds, very noisy too, hence the name screamer. And as fierce as they look, they're actually vegetarians. Many ibis and herons, uh, like this beautiful buff-necked ibis, which prefers drier terrain, and also the really unique looking plumbeous ibis, a very noisy species, another signature background sound of the Pantanal. And the whistling heron, uh, these herons prefer pastures and drier grasslands. And unlike um, other members of the herons and egrets, this one is actually fairly noisy. Uh, oftentimes giving a whistling call in flight. 
And of course, the raucous and common southern lapwings are found in the Pantanal. They oftentimes uh, are a good sign that a hawk or another predator is around as they fly around in circles screaming. This particular one is guarding its eggs, uh, three there in the nest, showing the spurs on the wing really well. There are also many snail kites, I mean by the hundreds in some places, uh, coming down to feed on apple snails, but they actually also feed a lot on crustaceans in the Pantanal, not just apple snails. Uh, this right here is a female or an immature bird. And uh, here is the wattle chacana, uh, sometimes known as the lily trotter. This is another species with a really fascinating breeding ecology. It's polyandrous. So the male will actually build the nest and females will visit multiple males to lay their eggs into those nests. And the male will then take care of the nest and of the young, while the female will actually defend those nests against potentially other females. Another fact that's really interesting is the nests are built on these cups of floating vegetation. And um, if the vegetation starts sinking or uh, there might be a flooding event or other threats to the eggs, the male can tuck those eggs under its wing and carry them to a safer location, which is a really unique behavior. And uh, these wattle jacanas are quite common in the Pantanal. And you can see so far, I mean, the photographic opportunities here are just incredible. Uh, I've been able to take these photos during about two or three tours that I've done in the Pantanal, just giving you a bit of an idea of what's possible. And that was definitely not photo focused. The white-backed form of the black neck stilt is present. Again, these also oftentimes give away predators by flying around and calling. Then we can turn our attention to a slightly different habitat. This is a drier grassland with a lot of these terrestrial termitaria and these scattered trees. If you look in the uh, right tree there, the large tree on the right, the lowest limb has a jabiru standing on it. It's actually quite challenging to take a landscape photo in the Pantanal without having a jabiru in the photo. And this habitat is favored by this guy, uh, one of the really big mammals that we hope to see in the Pantanal. And the best chances for this are in the northern section, the giant anteater. You can see it's a truly impressive animal. Look at that claw on its uh, raised front foot there. Um, they actually have such long claws, they essentially have to walk on their knuckles instead of their uh, toe pads. And they use these claws to rip into uh, concrete hard uh, termite mounds. And they can um, suck up about 35,000 ants and termites per day. And here's another photo showing the size of one. Uh, they can grow up to seven feet, two meters in length. And of course, famously, they have their young riding on their back. So we always scan for them carefully. Um, while we're in the northern part of the Pantanal hoping to see them, and we usually have excellent luck with them. The smaller collared anteater, uh, also sometimes known as southern tamandua, is also present, and we can often find that one at night. This open forest also attracts white woodpeckers, a really stunning looking uh, woodpecker species. Very bizarre, has broad wings, reminds me a little bit of a Lewis's woodpecker in North America when they fly. They travel around in small groups, and their call sounds almost turn-like. So you hear them flying overhead, you think you have a group of terns coming your way. It's these bizarre white woodpeckers. Another interesting woodpecker that we can find here is the white-fronted woodpecker. This is a species much more typical of the Chaco to the south of the Pantanal, often associated with cacti, but there seems to be a low density resident in the northern Pantanal here. So we always make a special effort to track it down. And of course, to add some color here is the toco toucan, one of the largest toucan species in the world, uh, fairly common throughout the Pantanal. And uh, scientists now have uh, figured out that these toucans actually use their oversized bill to radiate heat, uh, much like elephant ears. So it increases the surface area of the entire bird up to 50% in some toucan species, and they can radiate heat that way and lose heat which anecdotally makes sense to me because I oftentimes see toucans sitting out on an exposed perch in the middle of the day while all the other more reasonable birds have, uh, are hiding in the shade. The chestnut-eared arasari is the only arasari in the Pantanal, uh, so easy to identify, and they will actually readily come to fruit feeders 
and some of the lodges allowing for close views and great photos. And so will the orange back trupial, a large species of oriole that will also readily visit feeders. If the feeder setup is near riparian vegetation, near a river, it will attract large numbers of yellow-billed cardinals, a really stunning bird to come in big numbers to the feeders. This is a species um, that has been successfully introduced to Hawaii, actually. And in a shady spot, we may see the savannah hawk perched on a fence post. This is a beautiful cinnamon orange collared raptor uh, with broad wings and a short tail, and they mainly hunt small reptiles, small mammals, and large insects. And the Pantanal is also a fantastic place to see great crane hawks, which are quite common here, usually found in the canopy of some of the taller trees. The subspecies here is quite different from what uh, some of you may have seen in Central America. It's heavily banded underneath and has a pale eye versus a red eye. The other interesting thing about this hawk is it has these really long legs and they clamber through trees looking for crevices and cavities to reach in to extract prey. And their legs are actually double jointed. So they're really flexible to be able to get into these cavities. So in some ways, it is the ecological counterpart of the African harrier hawk. Even the plumage is uh, somewhat similar superficially. And then the noisy and social guira cuckoo. They move around in uh, good-sized flocks. There are communal breeders, so multiple females will lay eggs into one nest, and then the group uh, and helpers will take care of those eggs and the young very noisy, um, about the size, uh, larger than a squirrel cuckoo. So a good sized bird, often feeding on the ground and readily approachable. And then some other common garden birds around the lodges include things like this rufous bellied thrush and white tipped doves will be strolling across the lawn confidently uh, between the bungalows and the restaurant of the lodges, for example. And in some of the pastures, we can find the yellowish pippet has a very distinct um, descending flight call as it gives its flight display. And this is a widespread pipit found from Panama all the way to Argentina. And since they, uh, these are the neotropics, flight catchers are of course uh, abundant and highly diverse. There are in fact about 70 species of flight catchers alone found in the Pantanal. Fortunately, many of them are not difficult to identify like this beautiful white rump monjita perched on a termite mound here. Well, this one should also uh, offer no identification challenges. The tiny, wetland-loving, white-headed marsh tyrant. I can't think of many other birds that have this sort of classy plumage here with a jet black body and pure white head. Maybe a white-headed woodpecker in North America, but that's about it. Really small flycatcher, uh, smaller than a sparrow, and uh, really fond of wetland areas. In these same wetlands, we can find this unique bird right here, the black-capped Donacobius. They have a really impressive display where they call and they inflate these orange air sacs on the side of their neck and their body bounces up and down and they fan their tail and swing their tail left to right. And they are quite common in the Pantanal and fairly widespread in South America and even going to Panama. What's really interesting about them is for a while, they were considered to be uh, wrens, really unusual wrens. And now we understand that they're actually part of the old world Soviet warblers. So this is an old world lineage. This is the only member in this lineage. It's a monotypic family that is present in South America. So taxonomically, they're now placed between the Locustellid warblers and Malagasy warblers. I mean, that's, that's pretty... Pretty, cra pretty crazy taxonomic history there, a little bit like the rented in North America, which is also the sole member of an old world lineage. And in the gardens, we can also find the beautiful green barred woodpecker, which uh, prefers open habitats. And of course, we have our first chances to see one of the most wanted birds and signature birds of the Pantanal, the incredible hyacinth macaw. And like I said before, due to conservation efforts, and protection of the species from poaching. They really increased the numbers and are readily seen in the Pantanal now. This is the largest flying parrot in the world, uh, about a meter long. And it uses that massive bill 
to crack through hard palm nuts that it feeds on. And you can see that yellow facial skin gives it sort of this constant goofy grin. They're essentially gentle giants. Uh, they're not even that noisy for a macaw. Um, oftentimes travel in pairs or small groups and they will readily come to the ground to feed and to drink water. But one of the most wanted species in the Pantanal and really impressive. Here you can see a close-up of one peeking from a nesting cavity. This is a natural cavity. Uh, they prefer manduvi trees but um, certain conservation projects have also established artificial nests to help uh, the species increase in numbers because it really needs these large old trees which are being felled unfortunately for nesting. And again, you can see this massive bill right here that it uses to feed on its uh, specialized seed. Just an absolutely magnificent, uh, wonderful bird. And uh, they are oftentimes uh, quite approachable allowing us to get great photos of them. There are more than uh, 20 species of parrots in total in the Pantanal. Brazil actually has some of the highest diversity of parrots anywhere in the world. And uh, we can see about 20 of them in the Pantanal, like this yellow collared macaw, very small macaw species, it's relatively quiet and uh, somewhat uncommon, but we do have good chances of seeing it in the northern part here. And then the colorful and beautiful peach-fronted parakeet also trickles in, uh, more typical of the Cerrado habitat to the north here, but occurs in good numbers in the Pantanal also. There are also monk parakeets, which build their large stick nests, and there are also Nande parakeets in other parts of the Pantanal that we can look for. In addition to this incredible diversity, the other thing that stands out about the Pantanal are just the numbers, the sheer density of wildlife. And it's not uncommon to see feeding congregations like this right here. And I can't think of many other places in South America where you can see this. Here you can see jabiroos, wood storks, great egrets, and a few snowy egrets all crowding into this receding wetland. So as the dry season progresses and the water uh, sources shrink, it really concentrates the fishes and amphibians and other prey species, and these birds just crowd in, taking advantage of these situations. And it's not just birds that crowd in, but also crocodilians like these jacara caimans. And um, they will go into smaller and smaller water holes uh, where there, some people have observed concentrations of 10,000 in one lake. And overall, uh, there are an estimated 10 million caimans are present in the Pantanal. And this is by far the largest concentration of crocodilians anywhere on the planet. And this, surprisingly, is the main prey of jaguars in the Pantanal. It's, I mean, amazing that a jaguar will take on such a fierce looking animal, but they do. And that's really mainly what they hunt along the river edges. And that's what allows the um, jaguar population to thrive here is this abundance of caimans which in turn are relying on the abundance of fish caused by the flooding, the annual flooding of this basin. Here's just another photo showing another feeding concentration. This is right along the edge of the Transpantanera and uh, sometimes it's actually quite difficult to make your way down the Transpantanera without stopping every 100 meters because there's so much wildlife to see, so much to photograph. And again, these are wood storks and jabiru and egrets feeding in a, in a ditch here that's concentrating the fish. And then we also spend time in some of the woodland sections. So this does not flood during the rainy season and supports this rather tall, dry forest, which is uh, really diverse for a couple of uh, Pantanal specialty species that we can see, like this chestnut belly guan. This is a threatened species that uh, is doing quite well in the Pantanal. And um, it's, uh, the population is stable here and we can oftentimes see it fairly easily. And also the only trogon of the Pantanal, like this uh, blue crown trogon is found in the canopy adding quite a bit of color. And the Amazonian motmot. So this is another example of a typically Amazonian species that trickles into the Pantanal 
where it is restricted to these wetter parts of the forest. Actually easier to see in the Pantanal than it is in Amazonia itself, but also adding to the diversity in color here. And the tiny white wedged piculet, really small woodpecker, about the size of a sparrow, or actually a bit smaller. And the elegant long-tailed ground dove. This is a range-restricted species and the Pantanal is an excellent place to see it. It's fairly retiring, oftentimes hanging out in thickets or, or palm trees, and, uh, but good place to track it down in the Pantanal, very beautiful wing patch. And since we are in the Neotropics, antwerts are of course uh, very diverse, uh, like this widespread barred ant shrike can be found in the Pantanal. And in total, we see about 10 species. So not as diverse as Amazonia itself, but there is a good variety of ant birds and ant wrens to track down. One of the specialty species of the Pantanal is the large-billed ant wren. That's a canopy species. And this right here is a female with this beautiful rusty coloration on its breast and, uh, and head. With luck, we can also find the black-bellied ant wren. This is another species that's much more typical uh, in eastern Brazil, so to the east of the Pantanal and those drier habitats, but it does seem to trickle into the northern Pantanal. We always make an effort to track it down. It's a stunning uh, ant wren. Here's the male, jet black underneath. The more typical ant wren in that genus that's found in the Pantanal is the rusty back ant wren. And here also male, and this one prefers low shrubby areas and uh, it's relatively easy to see for an ant wren. And this is another interesting example of a bird trickling into the northern Pantanal from the Cerrado. This is the spotback puffbird, has been split as the Katinga puffbird now. And I'm not entirely sure whether this bird is expanding its range or not, but there is a pair or maybe two pairs now present in the Pantanal. And we always make an effort to track this one down also. And this is another Pantanal specialty, uh, range-restricted spine tail, the white lord spine tail. And its distribution really centers on the Pantanal. And for spine tail, it's actually not too difficult to see as it moves around this rather open understory. And uh, of course, we make an effort to see this guy. And it's a large spine tail and relatively uh, showy. And one of the highlights of these forests here, of course, is the helmeted mannequin. Absolutely stunning mannequin with this jet black plumage and this crimson crest. Uh, the females olive green overall. And it's unusual among mannequins. It actually does not lick and it doesn't dance. It doesn't have a particularly fancy display. Uh, I believe it just relies on its um, unique sharp looking plumage to attract mates. So it sits in the sub canopy and calls regularly, but it does not do any uh, distinct display. There's the uh, incredible red-billed scythebill. Uh, the subspecies in the Pantanal has a particularly long and decurved bill, oftentimes follows feeding flocks. But among the wood creepers here in the Pantanal, the great rufous wood creeper has to be the best. I mean, this is an appropriately named bird. It's rufous and it's great. I mean, it, to see this bird flying through a gap in the trees, it's uh, larger than a jay and then goes smack onto a tree trunk right in front of you is really truly impressive and definitely one species you want to see in the Pantanal, by far the largest wood creeper in this part of South America. And some other oven birds include things like the rufous fronted thornbird, which builds these unique stick nests that are hanging off branches throughout the Pantanal. These stick nests can be uh, a meter in length, built over multiple generations with many chambers and entrances. There are also greater thornbirds which build similar stick nests near water. So you see these stick nests throughout the Pantanal. And these live in small uh, family groups. And in this forest, we can also see the three primate species that are native to the Pantanal, like this black-tailed marmoset. Uh, this one feeds mainly on tree sap and resin, a very small species. Another cool thing about the marmoset is it's unusual that they usually give birth to twins, which is unusual breeding uh, among primates. We can also see the Azaras capuchin. So the capuchin uh, monkeys in the Pantanal belong to the Azara species now. Taxonomy of capuchins changes all the time. Uh, 
uh, uh, these are quite, these are the most common primate in the Pantanal. And then the really impressive black howler monkey. This is one of the largest primates in South America. It's a foliar so it feeds uh, exclusively on leaves. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is the pelage, the fur color is sexually dimorphic. So the males are black as the name suggests and the females have this beautiful sandy gray color with this almost golden uh, face or forehead and chin uh, fur. Really beautiful primate. Not that common, but we can usually find it in the forest here, just in the northern section of the Pantanal. And it usually doesn't take too much effort to find a great patu on a day roost. Uh, sometimes a local guide will know about one. And uh, if not, we can usually check around and find one. There are also Nakunda nighthawks. Uh, when it's drying up, they uh, roost in these open, dry pastures, sometimes uh, dozens of them. Really excellent camouflage for such a large uh, nighthawk. And they oftentimes take to the air before dusk. Uh, really distinctive, pure white underneath. Really impressive uh, nighthawk. And the Pantanal is in general fantastic to go out looking for nightbirds. The open terrain allows for easy spotlighting. And we can oftentimes find uh, several species of nightjars, like the scissor-tailed nightjar. There are many common parakis, and even the uncommon spot-tailed nightjar. And there are also some owls, um, tropical screech owls in some of the forested areas. Uh, there's even a black banded owl now, which can be seen on some tours, and a variety of mammals also. And then the widespread ferruginous pygmy owl is numerous in the Pantanal and we oftentimes use its call to attract smaller birds. This particular individual was sitting right outside my room. Uh, the, this the red door in the background there is the door to my room, was sitting on a chair just outside the room, staring at me. It never moved, uh, even though I walked past it several times. And it was using the porch light uh, to, uh, hoping it would attract insects, of course, to hunt them. But that was quite a surprise having this guy sitting just right outside my room. The other interesting aspect about the Pantanal and birding there is that it's a meeting place of several migratory routes. So there are birds that migrate, that have wintered in Amazonia, migrate to breed in the Pantanal. There are some austral migrants that migrate north into the Pantanal from southern South America. And then there are also passage migrants that move all the way from North America to the southern tip of South America. To give you some examples here, and of course all these migrants add to the overall diversity, but here's an example, the white-throated kingbird, which uh, spends the non-breeding season in Amazonia and then migrates to the Pantanal area to nest. And this particular individual was really funny. I was sitting with my group in a shaded spot during the middle of the day, taking a break, having something cool to drink. And I wanted to point out this tropical kingbird and talk about the field marks and how to identify a white-throated kingbird in case we would see one later. And as I went through the field marks, none of them matched tropical kingbird because this was already a white-throated kingbird sitting right above our heads. They of course have a different call too. Another interesting migrant is the white-banded mockingbird. This is one of the austro migrants, so it breeds in uh, Argentina and then uh, moves north in the austral winter to spend the winter here in Brazil. Uh, some other species like Maguari, Stork, and various seed eaters do the same. And then one of the, one of the neatest migrants I've seen in the Pantanal must be this guy right here, the white-rumped sandpiper, uh, which we are of course familiar with from North America. But just imagine the journey of this bird. So, you know, during the breeding season, it'd be up in a place like Barrow, Alaska, uh, foraging alongside a polar bear territory, then moves through the Pantanal, um, pausing on this mud flat here, uh, you know, that potentially a jaguar would be walking by and then moving down to southern South America into the territory of penguins. I mean, what a journey this small bird makes. And we had this individual right here just in the middle of the river. And if I remember correctly, there really was a jaguar in the background at that time. So after we spend our time in the northern section here, um, in Mato Grosso, northern part of the Pantanal, Mato Grosso, we travel to the middle. So we continue down south along the Transpantanera, and there we spend time along some of these 
smaller tributaries. And we do a combination of boat tours there and walks in the riparian forest. This is a great place for kingfishers. All five species of South American kingfishers can be seen along the rivers here, including the largest, the ring kingfisher, also the smallest, the American pygmy kingfisher, uh, really uh, tiny kingfisher, um, a little bit trickier to see compared to the others. There are also plenty of Amazon kingfishers, of course, and green kingfishers are common. And we also have excellent chances to see the least common kingfisher and one of the trickier ones to see because it does like to perch underneath overhanging vegetation and in shady places, the beautiful green and rufous kingfisher. In fact, I've been here in certain bends of the river, certain sections of this river, where I've seen all five uh, kingfisher species within 10 minutes of each other. So great place to catch up with these guys and get fantastic views and good photo opportunities. We can also find cream-colored woodpeckers in the riparian forest here, which is uh, also another species much more typical of Amazonia that just sort of barely reaches this part of the Pantanal. And the smaller cousin of the great Kiskadee, the lesser Kiskadee, which specializes along uh, river edges and oftentimes perches on vegetation overhanging the water, much thinner bill, different call. Uh, another one of these 70 flycatchers that we can potentially see. And these riparian vegetation also attract the band-tailed antbird, a really cool little antbird that waves its tail around with that white tip to it. Looks like a miniature flag in sort of shady spots that it prefers. And the Pantanal is home to lots of sun bitterns. Sun bitterns are very common here, allowing for many views and photo opportunities. A stunning species, another monotypic family that's endemic to the neotropics, most closely related to the Kagu of New Caledonia, actually. But this uh, individual here just climbed out onto an open branch and was calling right in front of us. And since we are in small boats going up and down um, the, uh, the river, sometimes with the engine off, we can often get uh, fairly close to the wildlife. There are also plenty of herons in this area, like this Kokoi heron doing its sunning display. Uh, they probably do that to get rid of feather parasites, but this is like the South American counterpart of the North American great blue heron. The beautiful capped heron occurs in good numbers. On the right is a nice adult in breeding plumage. On the left is a young bird. And here you can see why the tiger herons got their name. These are two immature rufescent tiger herons uh, with this beautiful stripy pattern. Uh, in adult plumage, they don't have that uh, tiger pattern to them, but uh, another stunning species. And rufescent tiger herons, very common in the Pantanal. And so is the boat-billed heron. This is a bizarre nocturnal heron. You can see its large eye there and its oversized bill. They get active at night when they patrol the riverbanks looking for crustaceans and so on. And during the day, they roost in these shady places. So we carefully, uh, with the boat, motor along the river there, looking into these areas, hoping to catch one on the roost like this one. And then the absolutely stunning agami heron is also present. And the Pantanal is actually a great place to catch up with this heron. It is widespread, but always low density. And particularly during the dry season, as the water in these rivers recedes, these herons come out of the shady tangles that they prefer and much easier to see. This right here is a, a young bird. It doesn't have that greenish, bluish uh, body plumage with these silvery laces on the neck, but uh, nevertheless quite an impressive bird with this massive bill. And the Pantanal is also a great place to come to grips with the zigzag heron. Again, this is a fairly widespread species, but not easy to see anywhere. Um, it's really tiny. I've actually seen this bird uh, quite a distance away from water in the middle of the forest, where it can sometimes even hop around the canopy. Um, you can almost mistake it for an oversized ant shrike bouncing around a tangle. But uh, the Pantanal is a great place to see it. it calls mostly before dawn and at dusk. So one way to locate it is uh, be out on the river at dusk and listen for it as this muffled hoot call that it gives and then track down the area. Occasionally we can even find it after dark 
uh, by spotlighting along the river. But a truly bizarre little heron with this uh, amazingly beautiful zigzag pattern. This is an adult right here and always a treat to see. And if you've looked for the species anywhere else in Amazonia and you haven't seen it, the Pantanal is a very good bet for it. So after we explore the uh, center region of the Transpantanera there, we move south and we drive all the way to the end of the Transpantanera to Porto Jofre. And that's where we spend our time exploring the rivers there by boat, doing boat safaris, looking for large mammals. On the way there, we stop at a place called Campo de Jofre, which um, is a great place to see this stunning species, the scarlet-headed blackbird, which prefers these vast papyrus swamps. And uh, in addition, we can see uh, things like subtropical Doradito here, Maguari stork, and various rails and crates. With luck, we may even come across the endangered marsh deer, one of the largest deer in South America, with this really unique uh, black patterns on its legs. And uh, this is another threatened species that is doing fairly well in the Pantanal, uh, thanks to the wildness and uh, relative protection of this area. So once we're in Porto Jofre, we do most of our exploring by boat. And no matter how you actually stay in Porto Jofre, everybody visits roughly the same areas. So there are lodges on land, and then there are also these houseboats, which have been converted into lodges that are permanently anchored, or at least for the season, they're anchored here. And it's possible to stay on these houseboats and then get into these small open boats to explore uh, the rivers. And this is what it looks like. Uh, so again, this area is called the meeting of the waters because there are three rivers that come together. When we, uh, in the mornings, we go upstream and then in the afternoons, work our way back downstream. And just a beautiful area. And we're going along scanning the trees and the banks and the river edges uh, for mammals and birds. And uh, it's just, a spectacular experience because uh, anytime you come around a corner, you never quite know what to expect. For example, this is a, one of the best places to see the giant otter. This is one of the largest mustelids on the planet. They can grow up to 1.7 meters, a truly impressive animals. They're very social. They live in family groups. They have dens up on the banks of the river. And they're also quite noisy. Uh, more than 20 distinct vocalizations are known. And take a, take a look at that set of teeth right there. And that's what they use to uh, hunt fish, of course. Here's another close-up of an adult. Um, all the adults have unique uh, patterns to the throat there with these uh, beige, yellowish patches. And uh, they're sort of mortal enemies with jaguars. Jaguars don't really go after them because a family of river otters would be most likely be able to defend itself successfully against the jaguar. And of course, they mostly hunt fish, uh, including piranhas. And in this case right here, you can see this adult was successful in catching a sizable catfish. The other large mammal that we can see in this area is the lowland tapir. This is the largest native herbivore in this re uh, region can weigh up to 500 pounds, uh, also quite aquatic, can dive readily, walk along the bottom of the rivers. And here's an animal out of the water, giving an idea of its size, uh, truly impressive. Not super common in the Pantanal, but we can usually see one or two. And then of course, we always keep our eyes out for the big cat. This is really one of the main draws for anybody to the Pantanal. And we are really in the heart of the range of the jaguar. And uh, you scan along the river and you can basically, you're expecting, you're hoping, you're waiting for a jaguar to pop out its head out of any shady nook or cranny or behind a tree. And more often than not, that is exactly what happens here. Due to the protection here, there are hundreds of jaguars in this area. Nobody has an exact population estimate, but they are very common. And the sightings are very, very likely. Here, one just popped out its head uh, from the riverside vegetation, looking at us as we go past in the boat. But there are big cats, and cats do spend a lot of time resting, lazing around, and sleeping. And particularly during the middle of the day when the temperatures are, are high, 
they will find a shady spot and they will just rest up. And there are some jaguars that I've observed there. Um, you see them in the morning sitting in a spot, you come back three hours later and it's still in the same spot. This right here is a male. You can see the head is very large and the um, jaguars in the Pantanal are some of the largest jaguars on the planet because of that abundance of prey. It's the third largest cat on the planet, but another fact that's kind of cool, of all the cats in terms of size, it has the strongest bite force. It will actually bite through sea turtle shells in some parts of its range, uh, not in the Pantanal, of course, but they can bite through the skull of their prey. Here's another one taking the smart approach to the heat of the day, just resting in the shade. And that's oftentimes how we find them. In the late afternoon, they become more active. You can see one sitting down here on the river edge. And uh, one of the reasons you can observe jaguars so well in the Pantanal is that not only are there uh, big numbers of them, but they also have become habituated to the boats and the uh, visitors and the cameras. So they mainly ignore us. So we are basically in a boat in the middle of the river here watching these animals as they patrol their territories along the riverbank. And you really get to watch their behaviors. I mean, uh, I followed an individual jaguar for more than two hours, and it's just fantastic watching their hunting attempts and so on. I didn't get this in the full frame here, but this individual is actually looking down at a family group of giant otters that are kind of taunting it. Uh, it won't be um, silly enough to try to attack them, but it climbed into this brushy tree and looking down at them as the otters are um, bobbing up and down in the water. And this jaguar then climbed accidentally into an ant's nest and had ants all over its paws and its face. And it was just having a really bad day actually. But the Pantanal allows you to really observe these animals for long periods of time and get great photos. They readily take to the water. They have large paws. Uh, they're, so they're excellent swimmers, which is uh, really good in this watery habitat that they live in. And then sometimes they do get curious, they'll just stop what they're doing, uh, pop out of the vegetation and have a close look at you. Again, allowing for more and more photos. This individual was particularly exciting. We had actually stopped to do some bird watching. Uh, we'd seen many jaguars already. And I told the boat driver to pull into this little cove um, where we were parked, kind of surrounded by vegetation, listening for birds. And I heard a, I remember it was a Cenarius breasted spine tail. I heard it calling on the far side of the river. So I uh, told our boat driver to just kind of slowly drift us across with a paddle. And as we're coming out of this hidden cove, I look over and there's a jaguar swimming right next to us. The jaguar had no idea we were there and we had no idea it was there until it was right next to us, which was a pretty exciting encounter. And uh, actually, as we're doing bird watching in the area, we do end up seeing, incidentally, seeing and getting close to many jaguars. And then that jaguar just nonchalantly uh, climbed out of the water, shook itself, and went on its own way, pretty much ignoring us. Although they are solitary, sometimes we do see interactions uh, between family groups or um, maybe even males fighting or mating. In this case, we had a female with a, a really cute cub here that were hanging out together and we were able to observe for an hour or two. And uh, the cubs will stay with the, with the mothers between uh, 18 and 24 months. But most of the time uh, we see them moving around in the late afternoon, which is perfect light for photography. And they patrol the riverbanks because that's where the prey is concentrated. So again, they mainly look for caimans and capybaras. They're not the most successful hunters. Um, most hunting attempts I've personally witnessed uh, were unsuccessful. The only successful hunt I've actually ever seen was one surprised a capuchin monkey that was drinking down by the river, which is not usual. But uh, so they'll basically prey on anything they can get, but they do focus on uh, caimans. There's actually one particular female jaguar now that has taken a specialized approach, uh, she'll climb up into a tree fairly high that's overhanging the water and then drop straight down on top of the caiman. But most of them are, are like this. They walk along the edge of the river and they're looking down the steep embankment, looking for caimans resting in the shallows or capybaras. Here's another one, a classic pose of a jaguar in the Pantanal. 
as it's moving along the river edge. And again, uh, there aren't really any other places in the world where you can see jaguars this consistently and uh, observe them for this length of time. And the Pantanal is really the heart and the best chance for the jaguar survival. Uh, although there are pop big populations in the Amazon, the Pantanal is really now one of the best places to see it. Here's one uh, taking to the water. This one was stalking some capybara that were resting on the sandbar. But like I said before, the uh, capybaras are very careful. They give their alarm call and shoot into the water like rockets and dive to safety. But it still makes for beautiful observation and nice photography. And I put this last picture in here just to show um, how powerful these cats are. And um, this photo, this is uncropped. Um, this is how close we were. And uh, what happens sometimes the Jago will move downstream and we can actually turn off the engine on the boat and just drift alongside it as it's moving uh, along the riverbank, allowing us to really get great views and just incredible photo opportunities. There are some birds, of course, along the riverbank here too. So we see some raptors like great black hawk and the beautiful fish eating black collared hawk, um, which uh, much like an osprey swoops down to pluck fish from the water. Uh, in this riparian vegetation, we can also see the blue-throated piping guan, which really uh, prefers river rind habitats. The subspecies here in the Pantanal actually has mostly a whitish throat. This river rind habitat is excellent for little cuckoo too, which skulk through the dense vegetation. And on the sandbars, we can see um, breeding birds like this uh, beautiful black skimmer. Yellow bill terns. So these are all incidental birds uh, to the jaguars, oftentimes in the same frame. And some shorebirds like this beautiful pied lapwing. But I sincerely hope you enjoyed this presentation and learned a couple new things about the Pantanal or were able to reminisce. And again, I appreciate your time and joining us. And uh, hopefully there'll be some questions. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stefan. That was, uh, wow, trip down memory lane for me and I'm sure for a lot of uh, folks who tuned in as well. Um, yeah, thank you to all of you uh, who did manage to to, to sign in and to listen to Stefan. Um, Stefan, there, there are a bunch of questions that have come through uh, during, during the hour. So uh, yeah, I guess without further ado, I'll get stuck into those. Um, but I think just before we start, there's been a few uh, really nice messages that have come through as well and um, a few folks have mentioned. So I'll just, I'll just take a time just to read out a, a couple of those that came through uh, during the actual presentation itself. Uh, this, brings, this brings back marvelous memories of the Pantanal with Forest a few years ago. I so enjoyed the snippets of information that Stefan provides. Biology, plumage, and taxonomy, etc. He is a polished presenter. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, right. Brings back wonderful memories of my trip there with Forrest and Leo a couple of years ago. Thank you. And then another one. Thanks go to Stefan for an excellent presentation and to a special lady, Nikki for all that she does and does so very well. Um, again, I couldn't agree more. Um, so yes, let's, let's get into some of the questions that have popped up there. There really are a, a bunch that have come through. Um, so just a quick one about temperatures, Stefan. What are the temperatures like during the tour? Um, <laughs> as bad as the state of Louisiana in the summer? So uh, not quite, it does vary. Uh, so as the dry season progresses from June into October, the temperatures go up. So in June, July, we're talking in the 70s actually. So 21 degrees Celsius. Um, amazingly, there can actually be cold fronts coming up from the south, which can lower the temperatures into the 45 Fahrenheit, seven degrees Celsius making it really cold, especially in the mornings on the boats. So it's important to bring layers. And these cold fronts are not ideal for wildlife because the tropical wildlife tends to hide. But during the months that we visit, September, which is kind of the middle of the dry season, temperatures will have gone up. Uh, we're talking in the 30 degrees Celsius, 80s to 90s. And then in the very end of the dry season, when we don't really visit, it can actually go up to 110 Fahrenheit and over 40 degrees Celsius. So when we're there, it is very comfortable. 
bit cool in the morning uh, on the boats, so important to bring a light sweater or jacket. And uh, during the hottest part of the day, we take a little bit of a break. And not very humid, actually. Surprisingly mm -hmm. not humid. Great, yeah, thanks for that rundown, Stefan, that was, that was great. Um, completely agree, I was actually surprised when, when I did a trip back there, a private trip, um, we were there sort of late July, and I was surprised how cool it was. I was expecting a lot more, a lot more warmth and yeah. got taken it's by surprise. Actually, very, very comfortable. Yeah. Um, mosquitoes, how bad are mosquitoes, and is uh, malaria medication needed? Uh, not, mosquitoes are not uh, a big problem. Um, you know, on the rivers, it's flowing water. Uh, maybe in the evenings, uh, there are times when mosquitoes will come out right around dusk, and uh, we usually avoid those areas during that time. And any basic uh, repellent will help. And malaria is not really endemic to that part of uh, Brazil. Uh, any travel doctor will recommend it always, because they take a look at the entire country of Brazil, and they say, oh, malaria is present but it's not really necessary for this part of Brazil, but you have to use your own judgment there. I never, I have never taken any malaria medication anywhere in South America, personally. Excellent, thanks for that, Stefan. Um, the photo is absolutely fantastic. Uh, a few comments on, on that regard. Uh, what, what lens are you using? What's, what's equipment you're shooting with? So this is a combination of several trips. Uh, like I said, I think this is from maybe two or three trips, and I just wanted to use my own photos to give an overview of what the possibilities are. Again, this was not a photography trip at all on my end. Uh, I was leading groups. But so I slowly progressed. I think some of them were taken with a 300 millimeter Canon lens, and now I use a, the Olympus mirrorless camera with mm. the fixed 300 millimeters that gives you essentially a range of 600 millimeter. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, if you put a bit more time and focus on photography, um, it's just the opportunities are just endless. And the wildlife is really approachable. And every year I go, uh, there seem to be more jaguars, more sightings, more interaction. Uh, it's really, really, heartwarming and a positive thing I've seen there with the ecotourism really boosting the populations of jaguars and protecting them. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a special place. I think, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's, it is, it's, it's volumes that kind of, yeah, really, really capture you when you go there. Just the, yeah. the, the sheer volume of, of, of species and the numbers, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, let's have a look over here and see. Um, when are we next? Uh, when are you next touring there, Stefan? When am I next touring there? Personally, mm -hmm. I, I actually don't don't know. Um, <laughs> next, I, I should know, probably check the calendar. <laughs> things are always a bit up in the air, obviously, right now. I know my next uh, trip to uh, Brazil is. Uh, I actually I'm doing the northeast endemic, uh, the mega there. I don't know when I'm next uh, returning to the Pantanal at this moment. <laughs> Uh, we have many excellent tours that we offer with um, many of other. I don't know uh, who of us is doing the next tour there. But lots of experienced guides. Yeah, I'm not sure myself either. I could quickly, quickly go on and check, I guess. But you could always check out the website as well if anyone's keen. You can have a look at those dates. As Stefan says, it's uh, around that sort of September time frame when we start offering the trips there. That sort of August, September, October time frame. Um, best places to see maned wolf, Stefan. Um, and, you know, do, does Rock Jumper go there and, and what are the chances of finding them and sort of viewing them? So uh, on this particular tour, the Pantanal tour is combined with a visit to the Cerrado, the Ch Chapada Gimares, which is a mountain, a mountainous Cerrado area just to the east of Cuiabá. And main wolves are present there. Actually, one of the lodges that we uh, frequent has regular sightings of it, but it is by no means guaranteed. It is an uncommon, uh, pretty shy mammal. Um, there are other parts of Brazil, like Emas National Park, uh, which mm -hmm. probably is better for a main wolf sighting. And uh, there's even uh, the famous monastery in one part of uh, central Brazil where the main wolves come every night because the monks have been feeding them for year, years. But uh, during the Cerrado uh, part of this tour, of this 10-day tour, it definitely is possible 
to see main walls. And I've actually been to that spot myself uh, many times. I've seen tracks and um, while I didn't see a main wolf there, I actually had a mountain lion walk down the middle of the road one morning, which was also pretty impressive. So always uh, interesting wildlife to see. That's very special indeed. Um, I was also asking here about um, logging. Have any of the areas been previously logged? Um, and then just tying in with that question, someone else is asking about the, um, obviously the Brazilian, uh, rainforest and the Amazon have, have had a lot of destruction over the years. Is it impacting the Pantanal at all? Yeah, so the uh, main impacts to the Pantanal are the, the Pantanal itself is almost naturally protected because it does flood annually, so it doesn't make it really suitable for um, agriculture. And cattle ranching kind of is, is a is sort of a mild use of the land, so it kind of goes hand in hand with wildlife. The problem is that some ranchers are expanding their pastures by cutting down forests. And that is a problem that conservationists are working on. Particularly, we need these large trees and these tree islands as refuges for mammals and the hyacinth macaw, for example. The main threats to the Pantanal come more from the outside, actually. Uh, like increased agriculture leads to pollution upstream. So as water flows into the Pantanal, it carries these pollutants with them. There is a lot of gold mining in Mato Grosso, just north of the Pantanal, which also leads to pollution. So conservationists are really taking a close look and implementing things to protect this wetland. I mean, this is truly one of the last pristine, undammed wild wetlands on this planet. And just the abundance there, you know, we need to, we need to maintain that. Um, the Amazon is a different story, you know, for example, in the northern part of the state of Mato Grosso, a couple hours north of the Pantanal, uh, has seen some of the highest deforestation rates of the Amazon rainforest. And it's really eating away on it. And then Rondonia to the west has been almost entirely deforested. So yeah, those problems do continue and particularly now um, with the forest fires. But the Pantanal itself, just by its size and inaccessibility, is still relatively protected and we need to make sure it stays that way. And ecotourism has a huge impact there. I mean, 20 years ago, you'd go there and you'd get lucky to glimpse a jaguar. And now you can go and during, um, you know, two or three days in the right habitat, you can have fantastic observations like this guy uh, licking his lips right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, absolutely. <laughs> um, yellow fever, is that an issue at all? Sorry? Yellow fever. Um, yes, uh, it's a good idea to have the yellow fever vaccination. It just makes uh, getting into many countries easier. Many countries require uh, having proof of a yellow fever vaccination. So if you plan on doing any uh, traveling in South America, around the world, it's a good vaccination to have. Excellent. Um, and then a few, a couple of questions coming in here. Um, yeah, absolutely wonderful. I say great memories. Uh, best time for birds versus jaguars. Um, and then another, another person was asking, is there a better time of the year to see the jaguars? How often do you see them? Okay, um, again, the, the so let me tackle the bird question first. Uh, it does change, and that's why I put in those three slides talking about migration, because there is an active migration moving in and out of the Pantanal. So the diversity does change. Uh, there's no bad time for birds. Uh, I wouldn't go too early uh, if there's too much water, um, you know, like May or, or March. I mean, nobody really goes then, but uh, the wildlife would be very dispersed. But throughout the dry season, you have different migrants passing through. So the diversity always stays high and uh, the residents are always there. And many of the target species, uh, like I didn't mention Mato Grosso ant bird and things like that, they're resident, so they're always there. And the jaguar sightings increase kind of as the dry season progresses. So September, October, it can be very good uh, as the river, river levels drop, the jaguars come out further out of the vegetation and uh, can be uh, easier to see. 
but there'll also be more visitors and the temperatures will be higher. I've been to the Pantanal in June, July, and September, and every time it's been fantastic. But I did note that in September, uh, you would see more jaguars more frequently. Nice. That's a uh, yeah, very in-depth answer. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, gives a lot of, lot of overview and perspective. Um, then another one, what are the main months for migration? So um, I would also say September is the best because that's when uh, migrants that are breeding in the Pantanal, but they're wintering, let's say in Amazonia, they're returning and you get these austral migrants coming up or moving through. And um, with great luck, you can actually chance into some really rare seed eaters that are coming up from places like Argentina uh, during the right conditions. And some of that actually depends on what's happening in wetlands to the south of the Pantanal. I've had one year where I think it was very dry in the south and we had maguari storks by the dozens, for example, and one year they were nowhere to be found. So it does vary. But uh, again, September would be, would be an excellent time to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, hummingbirds? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't put any in here. Uh, there are hummingbirds in the Pantanal. Uh, including there's a really, um, what is it now, uh, Rufus Breasted Hermit, there's a really, I hope I got that right, a very range restricted hermit that uh, can be seen. Uh, there's some uh, golden, uh, golden tails and golden throats and um, so I would say about a dozen species are possible. Um, there aren't any hummingbird feeder setups there, uh, so we have to get them in situ in the wild. Um, but there are about a dozen species can be seen, including a couple of really neat uh, range restricted ones. And uh, I don't have photos of them because as you, if you have any experience with them in the wild, they oftentimes move on quite quickly, especially the hermits. But there, mm -hmm. there is a good selection. And then in the Cerrado portion of the tour, there are absolute stunners like swallow-tailed hummingbird, horned sun gem, uh, even coquettes are possible. And that really adds to, I mean, the Cerrado portion itself adds uh, more than 100 species to the trip list. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just a quick one uh, for those that we've still got um, yeah, close to 190 people who are on. Uh, we've got a lot of questions over here still. I'm going to try and we've got time for about another four or five or so, I think, Nikki sure. uh, and Stefan. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll run through through a couple of those. Um, some folks asking about the field guide, uh, which bird field guide is recommended, Stefan? So, yeah, actually, I have it right here. Uh, this is um, a, a site a specific uh, field guide to the Cerrado and Pantanal habitats. So it's really nice to have. Um, it has excellent illustrations and it really narrows down the birds. It includes everything you can see on our Pantanal Cerrado tour with uh, great, uh, great descriptions, great introductions to the uh, different ecosystems there. So I can highly recommend that if you are mainly going on this tour. Of course, there is a uh, Van Perlo guide to all the birds of Brazil. Um, the illustrations do have some issues. It's not easy to make a field guide with nearly 2000 species. Uh, and then I think uh, Zimmer, Kevin Zimmer, of course, is working on his field guide. And when that comes out, that will be probably be the go-to guide to the birds of Brazil. Yeah, absolutely. Um, harpy eagles, Stefan, what are the chances of, of seeing a harpy eagle? Yeah, surprisingly, actually, there seems to be now a harpy eagle present in Chapada Jimares in the Cerrado. So there is a... Um, it's, it's a small chance, uh, harpy eagles are unpredictable, but I have seen it during this tour. In, the, in Chapada Jimares, uh, I know Forrest Rowland has seen it during one of his tours really well, and we were just birding one of the uh, River Rhine forests there, and um, a bunch of Arasaris went off, and I look up and there's a harpy eagle flying through the canopy with, with an Arasari in its talons and everybody got a good look at it as it shot through and disappeared. So it is possible. It seems like um, the harpy eagles are expanding into, uh, into the Cerrado. And in addition, of course, we offer the Cristalino extension, which goes to the Southern Amazon uh, to this tour, which I highly recommend. And there are also good chances of 
uh, harpy eagles there during one tour i remember we had two sightings of harpy eagles one in cristalino one in the Cerrado, and one sighting of crested eagle it was a, a very very lucky group <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> oh, fantastic it's very very special birds to see those um all right, and then finally, just uh, how many species are usually seen on the trip um, and how many days is the trip into the Pantanal? So the Pantanal and the Chapada Gemares trip are 10 days. So about seven days in the Pantanal and uh, three days in the Chapada Gemares area in the Cerrado, all uh, starting and ending in Cuyaba. And then of course, there is a, a nearly a week long extension to the Cristalino area in the Amazon. So it's a little tricky to say because we always do that trip combined with Cristalino uh, and that combined trip with the extension and the main trip uh, garners, uh, I mean, almost more than 500 species. I mean, almost 600 species in some cases. It's a massive bird list. So I would say the Pantanal Cerrado tour itself, uh, more than 300 species, more than 350 species for sure. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, folks. That brings us to the end. Um, Nikki will close off for us, but just from my side, thank you all for joining us. And Stefan, absolutely wonderful. Thank, and thank you. you for putting it together, again, Keith and Nikki. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Keith, and everyone for the superb Q&A. And a massive thank you, Stefan, for another excellent webinar. It's easy to see why guests have commented in the past on your upbeat personality and have loved not only that you are a great birder, but that you are thoughtful with top quality uh, people skills. Next week, join us as we take a midweek mid -week virtual getaway uh, to a tiny country of Israel, which is well known within birding circles as it's incredible, um, for its incredible migration spectacle. Uh, where thousands of raptors pull through I islet um, and other locations offering a truly mind-blowing interaction with the natural world. Join Rock Jumper's uh, tourney leader, Johan Pullman, as he showcases his remarkable home country with an exceptionally rich history to augment the birding experience. Johan will give us a wonderful in-depth understanding of what one can expect and enjoy within uh, the borders of Israel. These webinars are offered free of charge, but if you wish to donate to our tour leaders unable to work, the GoFundMe donation page is still open and the link can be found in your chat box. But from all of us, from the Rock Jumper team, thank you, see you next week and goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, everyone.